Hi, this is Stephen Maurer from Rent Valley Community College. Um, this is for CSIT 256, Computer Architecture and Assembly Language. And um, this is going to be one of the three videos for specific topics within um, Stallings Chapter 6. This is going to take a look at magnetic disks. Um, the initial plan was that this should fit within 15 minutes. But if I run out of time, then this is part one of part two. Uh, but hopefully we'll get it all done and over with within 15 minutes. Um, so the magnetic disks, um, well, what we have in terms of the disks is there's a platter. And um, the underlying material of the, uh, of the platter um, is non-magnetic. This is also known as the substrate. Um, and it, it varies depending on the drive. It could be made of aluminum or aluminum oil. Uh, aluminum oil. <laughs> aluminum alloy. <laughs> or it could be made of glass. Uh, I know glass sounds very fragile, um, but the thing is glass is very smooth, and that's one of the th reasons why they're, they're looking at. The um, substrate is then covered with this magnetized uh, material, and the idea in the magnetized material is that the um, um, particles can be aligned, the magnetic particles can be aligned, basically think of it as like north or south, and then logically one of those is true and one of those is um, false. So what the um, right head does, and this is going to vary depending on the drive, whether there's two separate heads, but most magnetic disks um, have um, a right head and a read head. Um, they just travel together, uh, meaning it's, it's, it's a fixed mechanism that has both on it, and then one's enabled for writing, one's enabled for um, reading. Um, well, there's a picture in the book, and I didn't want to violate copyright by showing it, that um, shows this um, coil with a, a, a electricity flowing through it. And what that does, that produces a magnetic field. Well, when the current goes one way, it uh, magnetizes uh, in one direction. When the current goes the other way, it magnetizes in the other. So when the right mechanism is going over um, the drive, depending on the current, the direction of the current going through the coil, um, it'll basically set you know north-south in terms of the magnetized particles, which is the equivalent of true-false. Um, the read mechanism um, has this, um, I don't know why I just pictured Magneto from uh, uh, X-Men, that's not the one, uh, <laughs> magneto-resistive sensor um, that will sense the direction of the magnetization. Magnetization. Um, so by going over the mag magnetized particles, you can detect is it north south or south north, meaning is it uh, true or false. Um, the the pictures that are here um, not, may not be the best in the world. My artistic skills are really bad, but I'm going to try to get the point across. Um, and we'll look at first the side view and then the top view. But imagine this is the side view looking at. And think of it as being four disks, four round uh, uh, disks. We're looking at the side view of it, and these disks are you know, evenly distributed, and they're on uh, a spindle. So uh, these things here, those are the platters, um, and they're um, anchored around this uh, spindle in the center. And they do rotate. So, so these platters will rotate, and they rotate in unison. And we'll see in the top view a little more about what is on it itself. Now, for each platter, so when we're talking about a double-sided disk, and the magnetic disks that we have are double-sided, there's a read-write head on both the top and the bottom of each platter. So if we have four platters, then we'll have eight read-write heads. Um, so a read-write head for the top of this first platter, a read-write head for the bottom. A read-write head for the top of this platter, a read-write head for the bottom. And what will happen is the read-write heads will move in unison. So they will move to the same track. The collection of tracks at that point is known as a, um, a cylinder. So the top view, um, so the, the top view is the gray that I have represented here is where the data is being recorded. The white is the space between it. This is over-exaggerated. I'm just a lousy artist and I gave up. Okay, so I'm sorry. It's that the gaps are not that big. The gap isn't bigger than the track. I'm just... Um, have no hand-eye coordination. <laughs> so the idea is the track is that is where, um, so the read-write head, so here we have the read-write head over here, um, is over, um, well basically it's over the disk, the disk is going to rotate around. 
And so on the right part is going to be magnetizing the particles that are on um, the track. If it wants to go to another track, it'll then move the read-write head. They'll, they'll move in unison. It'll move into another um, track. But it's the track is where the data is recording. Now, you got to make sure when you're recording this track here that you don't affect this track here. So I have it over-exaggerated here. But what's between the tracks is this inner track gap. From a manufacturing point of view, what they try to um, improve over time is they try to close the gap. Because um, what happens is the gaps, that's wasted space. It's space where data could exist, but it doesn't uh, because it's not uh, being used. Now, when we um, logically break down a drive into these things called sectors, and they're these pie-shaped wedges. Mm, pie. Uh, they're the pie-shaped uh, wedges. And again, I'm a lousy artist, but the idea is this is a sector. Um, there's a gap between and then another sector. Uh, a gap between another sector, a gap between another sector. And I know I didn't do these to size, and, and I know it looks really primitive. I apologize. But trying to show is that um, we do have the, these sectors. And by the way, something I'll be mentioning later is that um, the drive moves faster towards the center than it does towards the outside. And so um, the same number of bits is on each sector. They're just closer together, closer to the center. They're uh, further apart um, away from uh, the center. But again, when we're writing out a sector for a track, so what this is supposed to represent, it's kind of supposed to be on the track itself, is the track sector. So it's for a track. It's the sector that's being written um, for, for the track. It, and, and basically, it's a block of data. And we'll have another slide where we'll take a closer look at how that data is um, laid out. Well, if we're writing one of those track sectors, we don't want to um, overwrite the one next to it. So there are gaps. And again, from a manufacturing point of view, one of the things they try to do over time is to you know, minimize the gap um, because the, the gap, there's nothing written there, so it's a, a waste of space. Okay, so now um, in terms of um, access time, well, access time is the seek time. Seek time is the time it takes to move the read-write head to the appropriate track, and then there's the rotational delay, and what will happen is um, if, if, I, if I back up to where we were um, I'm sorry, if we look here before, if this is the um, data, but the read-write head is here, the rotational delay is how long does it take for that to get under uh, the read-write head, um, and which the average rotational delay, the average would be um, a half a, a rotation of the disk. The transfer time, so as the data was moving under the read-write head, um, as the data is moving into the read-write head, which basically is based on the speed of the drive, that's how quickly the sector moves under it. That will let us know what the transfer time is. Um, okay, so those are um, elements of um, uh, the magnetic disk. And did it just do something and I didn't see it? Oh, because I'm hitting the wrong key. Oh, my God. Um by the way, one of the areas in the book, they are talking about how to calculate the average rotational delay. Well, suppose we have a drive and we know its, uh, its uh, rotation speed is 11,000 revolutions per minute. Well, from the 11,000 revolutions per minute, um, we can then figure out, uh, well, we'll eventually get there. But uh, remember in, in, in math, uh, anything times one is the thing itself. So if I take this, which is revolutions per minute, and I multiply it by one minute over 60 seconds. Um, that actually represents one because the minute and the 60 seconds are the same thing. Um, and so the minute cancels out, and, and the 60 divides into the 11,000, and we get 183.3 revolutions per second. Um, so at 11,000 RPMs, there's 183 revolutions per second. Think of how fast that is. Um, now, one revolution would be 1 over 183.3, which is 0 0.00545 seconds. That's for one revolution. So if the rotational delay is the average delay, which means it's a, um, half a rotation, then if we divide that by 2, now we're going to get this, in this case here, the 0 0.00272 
um, seconds is the average rotational delay. That's how long we'd have to wait on average for the sector we're looking for to rotate under the read right head. Now, as for the, uh, the transfer time, um, the transfer time is uh, based on the speed in which the disk is rotating. So um, based on how many seconds it takes to rotate one revolution, <clears throat> we divide that by the sectors that are on a track. And then we'll know, okay, well, how long it takes to read one track. <clears throat> I'm sorry, how long it takes to read one uh, sector. And that'll give us an idea, depending on the size of the sector, is like how many bits per minute um, this thing is, uh, or bits per second it's uh, transferring at. In the prior picture that had the uh, sectors and um, those pie-shaped wedges and closer to the center, um, you know, it was smaller, f further from the outside, it was wider. And I mentioned it was the constant angular uh, velocity. Um, when we rotate the disk at the same speed, what happens is the bits per inch are, um, are, are further apart on the outer tracks than they are on the inner. So one thing from a manufacturing point of view, they figured out, well, let's change the speed of the disk. Let's slow the rotation down in the latter tracks. And if we do that, we can get more sectors into a track. We can get you know, less uh, wasted space. Um, what the book is showing um, in detail, and, and conceptually what we have here at a high level is the same, the idea that in terms of what's being written out for track sector, that there's a gap, then there's the ID field, then there's a gap, then there's the data field, then there's a gap. That kind of holds true um, uh, across the number of the drives. What's going to vary is how big is the data that's being written. Um, and, and there could be, depending on the drive being used, some other information here. But the ID and the ID field is basically identifying what is the data field that it's about to, to encounter. And so it's going to basically say for the data it's about to read, well, it's on this track and on this head, and this is the particular sector, no sector number. Um, there's a CRC check uh, just to detect if there's an error, um, which means when the drive starts to read, it's going to read the ID, and it's going to figure out, okay, what um, field am I getting in? And what will happen is, suppose it thinks it's on track 5 and it's really on track 4, it'll move the head to make sure it gets to the right track. So just in case, for some reason, it was um, a little bit off. Um, the advanced format that's used, the data um, portion of the field can be up to 4K uh, in size. Um, some drive characteristics. Um, now, on that picture we showed previously, the read-write heads did move in and out. So they moved to the appropriate track, but they didn't move beyond that. Um, there are there were some old drives in the past that had one read write head for each track and they didn't move whatsoever um, at all. Um, if you if you guys ever hold in the old days or ever heard in the old days they had these things called floppy disks, or even had things called zip drives, or they even had things called jazz drives. Those were removable. So a removable disk where the media can be removed from the drive. Um, the magnetic disks that we have it's uh, a non-removable disk. Um, that picture I had about the platters, I had the rewrite head on both the top and the bottom, that was double-sided. Um, there were a point in time, there were some single-sided discs where the recording only took place on, uh, on, on one side. Oops, sorry, I jumped ahead. Okay, good, let me app about this for a second. So in the old days, the floppy drives were single-sided, so there's only one rewrite head on one side. And what people would do is they figured out, hey, if we remove the floppy, turn it upside down, and stick it in again, we actually can write on the other side. So um, end up using both sides of the floppy. That only works if the thickness of the substrate, of the material itself, is thick enough so when you're writing on one side, you don't erase the other. And the other thing is the old floppies had a notch in it that would allow you to write, and you actually would have to manually crimp the notch in order to, uh, to flip it over. But the magnetic disks we have is, uh, is double-sided. All right, that ends uh, this piece. That was a train wreck.